All right, Joey, you don't oftentimes get a mulligan in a live podcast, but I put you on the spot and you had a, a brain fart, right? Yes, total brain fart. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an opportunity for everybody else. What does the I quadrant do? The I quadrant allows an investor to trade money for money. There it their, is. Their dollars are at work creating money. Not there it is. I mean, don't pretend like you don't know what it is. You're an investor, but I just had you. I had you on the spot, man, and, and you froze. Hey, hey, it's not unlike the rest of my life, Russ, where I get halfway through a joke and I cannot remember the punchline. <laughs> it's always you're, been a part of who I am. I just it, it is what it is. My mom just, had it and I just inherited it from her. You're just laughing. You're just yeah. laughing. I, I, I get it, man. I, I, the details are irrelevant. You knew it was funny, and you want to repeat it. You must share it with somebody else. Exactly. Exactly. All right. T- today's podcast, we're breaking down what can we learn from Elon Musk. I can't give away the the purpose of this podcast because we, we hold it out there for just a few minutes. But trust me, you're going to want to know all the things that – you can learn from these coaches and what we can learn from Elon Musk. Joey, you and I had a, a pretty cool meeting today at lunch. I want to share just a snippet of this, right? Just insight into what we're doing. We're trying to expand our short-term rental business. We trying we to think outside to, of the box. Always trying to think outside the box, right? Yes. We, we sat down with an owner of 2,300 units, apartment units here in Birmingham, right? Yes. And, and that was 2,300. That was two comma. Three zero zero. Yes. Yes. Amazing. Right. Like I love that about him that he has found his niche and gone super deep and we're, we're renting eight units from him right now. They're all one bedroom units and it's in a complex that has 12 total. So we have eight of the 12. So just let, let the listeners in on just some of that conversation and and what we're trying to accomplish. Cause I think it's so creative and interesting whether or not it actually works out or not. I think it's just a different way to think about how, how you can do stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, at the end of the day, what we found over the last year of working with him on this particular project is that these one bedrooms are a little bit volatile, right? Sometimes during the slowest time of the year, like right now, they only occupy around 45%, maybe 50% on the high end. When the other units, like our two bedrooms, tend to be more like 65 in the low 65 percent in the low times and so we were just saying you know how could we maximize it we still have two more years on this lease agreement with him and we want to maximize it enhance it and make it as profitable as possible we just said what would you think about either one selling us the property and he was like i'm not interested i want to hold on to these long term that's our strategy i'm like Hey, more power to you. I appreciate that. Or what about if we rented the entire building from you and we, in the, in the event that we could add kind of like adjoining doors in between the units. Sort of like you have in like a hotel, right? Exactly. Yeah. Where you you knock on the door and you can swing it open and your, your parents don't let you in or whatever. And (laughs) maybe that was just me growing up, but But this is what we were thinking would be really cool to put in between these units to offer now two bedroom options and even three bedroom options if they were all connected. So, you know, what's funny is he's actually considering it. And it's because we brought him the idea and we said, you know, let's make it worth your while. But anyways, that's just kind of a a new new way that we're thinking about this industry and what what the properties that we have to work with. Man, I, I think that that's so interesting. I, I, I'm I'm excited to hear kind of how this conversation goes. We'll let you in on what what re- ends up happening with this, whether we're able to take over this full building and start turning these one bedroom units into pass through units that we could make two, three, even five potential <laughs> bedrooms. Like, I mean, we could have like a bowling alley of open doors <laughs> to this thing. I mean, that would be cool. Think about that as an opportunity for a big family that was coming in town for a wedding or something. 
something like it's a different type of wedding venue. But you and I, we're not yeah. gonna give up on this wedding venue, this group activity opportunity. Still it's still holding on, still we, holding on. We just don't know how it's gonna happen. But th- <laughs> today's podcast is gonna be a lot of fun. Hope you enjoy it as much as we do. Joey, let's get to the table and belly up. Belly up. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome into the Financial Freedom Roundtable, where each week we break down complex financial topics so you can more easily understand them, and more importantly, take action on your path to becoming financially free. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Grateful to have you in the room. I'm Russ Morgan. They call me the idea guy, mostly because lack of follow-through guy, bad internet guy, didn't sound as good to me. Well, enough about me for a minute. Let me introduce you to my co-host, the Italian Stallion. He's got the license plate cover to prove it, Mr. Joey Murray. Stallion, good afternoon. Yes, sir. Good afternoon to you, my friend. I am, uh, I'm so excited to talk about Elon Musk today. (laughs) What can people learn from Elon Musk, Joey? That's the topic. Man, I, I think, I think there's a lot of things. In fact, uh, should we, should we let the cat out of the bag right away or should we invite everybody in first? No, no, yeah, definitely do not let it out of the bag, but things that have nothing to do with today's topic that you can learn from Elon Musk are how he eats a hot dog. (laughs) That is so bad. You can't do that. Okay. People were not a part of the pre conversation where you guys were asking whether hot dogs are sandwiches. And then we asked the community said, what do you think we're going to talk about? Somebody said, how Elon Musk eats hot dogs. Hey, I'm just telling you, you're missing out if you're not a part of the inner circle because this is a live crew. All right. We're we're talking about things that you need to know about, right? So get to the inner circle, get on a call with one of these coaches, go to wealth.wallstreet.com forward slash free call, and uh, and they will walk you through it. Mm, all right. Uh, other things, I'm coming to you, coaches. Other things somebody can learn. From Elon Musk that has nothing to do with talk, today's topic. That's I'm giving you a heads up because I know how you love me calling on you. But thankfully, Joey, you and I are not the only ones in the room. We do have the dream team of financial coaches. And to my left, I got Mr. Incredible. His superpower is speed to financial freedom. And the real beauty to that speed is it's contagious. My man, J.D. Hill. Say hello to your fans, J.D. Hey, fans. Uh, J.D.? It's my, it's my favorite part of the intro, by the way. <clears throat> Well, it's yours. It's for you. I would think like you would enjoy that the most. JD, tell everyone what they can learn from Elon Musk that has nothing to do with today's topic. Um, there are no engines in Teslas. Did you know that? They don't, they don't put an engine in a Tesla. It's no it's a, engine. It, it's a battery. Okay. W- which means there's a trunk in the front of the car and the back of the car. Gotcha. Yeah. So extra, extra space for luggage. Extra. My wife loves that actually. Um, and if you've never test driven a, a Tesla, you absolutely should test drive one. All They're right. so fun to drive. All right. Well, let, let me get to your left. A true financial Sherlock Holmes of our day. No problem. Too difficult to solve. If I was just only known you earlier, brother, I'd be so much richer. Say hello to Mr. Downtown Ernie Brown. Nice to see you, Ernie. Hey, nice to see you, Russ. Glad to be here. What is one thing that someone can learn from Elon Musk that has nothing to do with today's topic. How to regrow head hair. (laughs) Wow. I don't know where that, so tell me more about that. Look it up. Look it up here. I'll share. I'll share everybody. Just listen to this. I'm sorry. Seeing the whiteboard. Oh, wow. Look at this. Young today. Look at that. He's going backwards. Man, not natural. It's He's defying the is, odds. Is that like Benjamin Button right there? I mean, what was going on? <laughs> this is pretty good. Yeah. So if you if you're not watching live, you're missing out. As Joey said a second ago, but we just had a picture where Elon Musk seemed to be with a receding hairline at age what that five. Cul-de-sac haircut. Yes. <laughs> Another way to say it. And and today, nice head of hair. Nice. I love that. Got a little more, you know, side on the fairway these days. 
All right. Let's, enough, enough of you, man. I, I, got, I got to get over here to the retiree of the group, right? Speaking of retirees, Mr. Catch Me If You Can, if he's not killing bears with his bare hands or spear diving for tuna, he's dropping gold nuggets right here. The one and only Mark Haraguchi. Welcome, Mark. Good afternoon, gentlemen. What's one I mean, thing we can learn from Elon Musk? I would say how to put NASA out of business and keep them out of business. Ooh. Wow. He went there. I mean, yeah. what another great example of private enterprise finding a cheaper, more efficient, more streamlined, and economical way of doing business. Mm. Don't don't tell us don't tell the space force. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you you have a, a you know you, you know a lot about NASA. You, you have somebody in your family that's worked for NASA, so you you know like that's a that's a big thing there, man. Yeah. Well, here, here's my thing. I, I'll, I'll give you guys one thing that, I, that has nothing to do with today's topic, but part of fake news, I, I wanted to bring this up. And by the way, since since we're sharing, sharing's caring, right? I'm going to, I'll share my screen. I, I read this article today and it, it really kind of showed me the fallacy of people out there in the world trying to determine what's going on with finance. But did you guys know that Odell Beckham Jr. had signed a deal with the Rams back in November? And he decided to take it not in cash, but in Bitcoin. I think I saw that. Yes, well, yes, I did know that. You know, there was a time where oh, Elon I, Musk was going to take Bitcoin, right, for Tesla. That he, 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 he rescinded that. But this was the th this was something that it, that happened with Odell Beckham Jr. Can, can anybody here who's watching tell me where the area is. It says at the time bitcoin when when odell beckham jr took seven hundred fifty thousand dollars bitcoin was worth sixty four thousand dollars us dollars to the coin and today whenever this article was written i think about a week ago or two it was worth thirty five thousand dollars a coin so today that deals worth four hundred twelve thousand says odell beckham will be taxed on the 750 with federal and california state tax of combined 50 point Three, that means Odell now has netted 35000 from his RAM contract. Can anybody tell me where the math is incorrect on this, right? <laughs> like, there's one thing I would know about Elon is that Elon does the math pretty well. And this guy clearly is bad at math. It looks like Dave Ramsey put together this article. <laughs> <laughs> like he, he just assumed, right? Like you only pay tax on income if you transfer it to Bitcoin, right? Like it has, <laughs> you wouldn't have, he wouldn't have had to pay tax on it if he would have just taken it in U.S. hard dollars. It's so yeah. bad. It's like the worst. So anyway. But, we'll, but what we'll, does this have to do with our topic today, Russ? Bring us, nothing, bring us back home. It has nothing to do with our topic today, but I, I feel like I would cover <laughs> it just because we were in the process of talking about what is, what can we learn from Elon? Well, one, you can accept Bitcoin like our friend Odell Beckham Jr. did, right? And um, others will will be haters, right? Others will hate, but know what you know, right? We know that one, unless he sold that, he's not lost anything. Has he, Joey? Have That's you lost right. money in Bitcoin over the last couple of months as it's been going down? No. No, of course not you had. Why would you? All right. So today's topic, why is this important for us? Well, one, what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about how Elon Musk has made the news over the last four or five months in, related, in relationship to, the, to his tax bill. Joey, did you know that Elon Musk is reported to Oh, 11 billion. That's with a B. That's a, that's a double pinky right there. 11 that's right. billion dollars. That's right. In taxes. And that is reportedly the largest tax bill ever paid in the U S I have read that. I have not researched it to see if it was just more media hype, but I totally did read that. All right. Well, but up until that point, how much in taxes reportedly had Elon Musk been paying the previous years? I, I do not know, but it was not much. It was like around 3% or something like that is yes. what I read. So, like in, in many years, zero, right? Like yes. he, he had a very low, if any, taxable income. 
So one thing that we can learn from Elon Musk and other wealthy people is that financial freedom is defined by passive income being greater than our monthly expenses. Agreed. What's our largest monthly expense that most individuals have? Taxes. Taxes. Mm. So hence the reason tax season is approaching. We're recording this in February. Taxes are on our brains. A lot of times we we take action where we're in the greatest pain, right? We get ready to write the biggest tax bill. Not a whole lot of things you can do to uh, uh, impact 2021's taxes in 2022, right? But what you can do is impact the tax bill you're going to write in 2023 by what you may learn through this. Now, disclosure, Stallion. Are you a CPA? Not last time I checked. Earn, are you a tax attorney? Uh, negative. JD, are you uh, related to anyone in the IRS and uh, do any sort of uh, tax-related work for anyone? Uh, only on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Central. I'm sorry? Only on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Central. <laughs> That's right now. <laughs> All right, so raise your right hand. We, 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 have to, we have to perform this every single time we talk about taxes. Um, I, I promise to not give tax advice. I promise, I promise not to, to give, not give tax what was the last advice. part? Tax advice. <laughs> tax advice. Yeah. I promise anything that comes out of my mouth in regards to taxes, you probably should not um, accept it as the truth. Yes. What, yes. I what you that. said, I do. Not accept it as the truth. I, I promise that um, I will ask my CPA if anything we talked about is accurate after the fact and let you know after the fact. I will not ask him. <laughs> <laughs> all right perfect all right i just want to get that out there you know i mean for all the the haters i, I don't want anybody getting us in trouble here so he, here's three points that i think that we can cover from what we can observe from elon musk right i don't think any of us are our friends I, I have been in a car another thing you can learn from him is put in uh you know fart jokes are always funny regardless of where you are putting them in a car i think that that's cool nothing like hearing fart noises with a you know digital fireplace right so three points that we can learn and we're going to cover today i think one stallion is why it's important for us to invest in ourselves yes number two what is the i quadrant and why is that important number three what are some ways we actually can pay zero dollars in taxes you guys good with those three mm, i love that all right, so let's start with the first one. I'm coming, coming your way, JD. Oh boy, give me an example. So looking at Elon Musk, right? Mm -hmm. You can clearly say this man has invested in himself. Indeed. Why is it so important to invest in yourself? Um, there are areas in all of our worlds, uh, education-wise, known as a blind spot. Right. There is information that, you know, that, you know, to be true. I know my name is JD. I know the sky is blue, right? I know I need oxygen to breathe. There is information that I know exists, but I don't know anything about like nuclear engineering. No idea how that works. And then there's everything else that I have no idea that I don't know what I don't know. And the more that I invest in myself, right. The more that I can expand into areas that I'm unfamiliar with, like taxes, right? <laughs> Russell. Um, and, and so the, the reality is, is that the tax code was written for all of us to be able to understand it. But if I don't invest in myself, I'll never be able to understand it, mm. right? The government tells us exactly what we can do and can't do legally to be able to avoid taxes. And the more that I invest in myself and the more that, um, I partner with other people that are smarter than me, like Joey, Thank um, you for that. you're Thank welcome. You. You're welcome. The more that I start to understand, like, holy cow, I had no idea that was possible, but now I want to do it. So, so investing in myself helps me to raise my lid and helps me to understand what was possible that I didn't know was possible before. Give me an example of how you've been able to do that or how you've observed someone else doing that. So I'm not an attorney. Okay. Um, we have four different companies um, that we invest out of for various different investment businesses. Who's the we? Me and my business partner. Okay, perfect. And each of those companies is owned by a holding company. And this holding company owns 100% of each one of those individual entities. And then I own 50% of that holding company. And my business partner owns 50% of the holding company. And each of those entities are taxes as corps. And so this whole structure, this whole dynamic of how we've set all this up was done because of investing in ourselves, working with companies like CPS, learning from you and Joey and the things that you guys have done, 
that have now allowed us to be able to mitigate not only our risk in each one of these businesses, but also our taxes. Mm. Man, I, lo- I love that. All right, Mark, tell me, tell me one way that you can invest in yourself. Mark can't follow that up. Come on. Yeah, I know. I know. So I'm, ah. I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to try to follow it up. I'm, I'm going to take a completely different path, which is, and it's not necessarily along this line, but if you're not, if you're not investing in your health, then everything that JD said is, is null and void. It's moot. It doesn't matter. So if, if you're not taking time to maintain your own personal health, be that with exercise, diet, nutrition, or whatnot, proper sleep and everything, then everything JD said isn't going to matter. And furthermore, if you, if you are investing in yourself, then everything JD said is going to make even more sense because you're going to be so much leaner and meaner and more efficient with the energy and how you, you use your, your, your own time and, and your energy that everything in here is just going to be that much better. So that's my vision of, of, of how I look at investing in yourself. Because if, if you're sitting around this or listening to this podcast right now, let me ask you one question. What's your number one asset? And if you hadn't heard what I said before, I guarantee you there's a large swath of people who would have said, oh, uh, this, this investment, that investment, you know, this thing or that thing. And I think a very small percentage of people would have said, my health. Mm. Yeah. Can I, I want to add to what he's saying, but take it from a different angle. I think this speaks to the Wall Street mindset that we have to break free of. That we have been told that you don't have to invest in yourself. There's just this easy button. You just, when you go and work for a company, you just, a percentage of your income goes to this person who's smarter than you, who can manage a portfolio. And it's, out of sight, out of mind. You don't even have to know what it's being invested in. You just kind of trust the process. And I'm going to say the, one of the reasons that we exist is to challenge that thought process and say, what is truly possible if you do say, no, I'm not going to default to someone else who is potentially even faceless to me and just hope and trust that they're going to have my best uh, intentions in mind. Like they're going to invest on my behalf better than I could. Like if you, if you believe that, I want you to, to challenge that thinking and expect more of yourself. Like you are your best investment. And when you empower yourself by like whatever it is, whether it's books, mentors, um, masterminds, like being around a community of other people who are on the same path as we have built here at Wealth of That Wall Street. This, those are the things that are invaluable. I'm talking, they will catapult you to way the places that you never even thought existed. To JD's point, you start seeing the places that you never knew that you didn't know. And um, so anyway, I I just I get a little bit passionate about it because those lies that Wall Street has taught us, just they have to be pushed back. I just read this comment. It was so drawing joy. I wanted to share it. I realized that my time is not really mine. It's my company's. Now I have to stop negotiating my time for money and I need to start working to become financially free. That's exactly how I felt when my daughter Adler asked me on the way to school, dad, can you pick me up from school today? And I had to say, no, baby, I have to go to work. That's where I drew the line. In order for you to be clear on the things you need to do and stop doing and to know who you need to become so that you can stop trading time for money, join us right now at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash passport. Now let's get back to this episode. Ern, how about you? Well, to be honest, I think what JD was saying was absolute genius and there's so much in there. I I think it is true that Elon Musk earns more income than most people. And I would say over the past several years, he's also paid less taxes than most people. How did he do both of those things? JD was on it. He educated himself. He's got the same tax code as I do and as everybody else does. And he just knows how to use more of it. And he is investing doubling down in his businesses. He's staying in his own lane. And I hate to quote a hero, but, you know, Fleetwood Mac says you can go your own way. 
and it's got greater benefits and upside and it can inherently give you opportunities to keep more of what you're making. Man, so much better than don't go chasing waterfalls, you know? I love that. I love that. Man, <laughs> wisdom just just dripping out of you guys. This this is so good. Like when you think about investing in yourself, though, there's so many opportunities for us to invest in ourselves. That could be in mentorships that we can have. Go find mentors. You don't have somebody who that you're you're gleaning information from. Like there's someone out there that is willing to disciple you, to give you um, in, insights to what they've been able to do. Now, it may cost you a little time to help them, right? Masterminds. There's masterminds you can be a part of. At podcasts, I think, are the private masterminds that exist. Joey and I were just interviewing um, I, I guess Travis that was, Chappell. yeah, I, I didn't know if I was going to share his name, or not, but Travis Chapel with, with Guestio and how he's built an amazing business, but it started out with the desire just to meet interesting and successful people through a podcast and, you know, mentorships, masterminds, and then meetups. Another way we can invest in ourselves. We can go to whether it's a local real estate investment association meeting once a month, just to be around people who are wanting to invest and, and looking for ways. And even if you're not there to invest in real estate or be a private lender, just being in that environment will, will start to trigger things in you that can help you like get that desire, get that entrepreneurial itch going, because that is what Elon did from the very beginning, right? He was a part of the group that ultimately became PayPal, pretty imp instrumental company in our, in our country, right? Like he, he has been constantly investing in himself and through that creating businesses. All right. The, the, to, real quick. I just, to, to put a button on that, uh, I'm reminded of a, of another quote. I love quotes. Abe Lincoln. Anybody know who Abe is? Yeah. I'm not yeah. familiar. Go ahead. Not familiar with Abe. He's, he said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. And I think so many people spend more time swinging the ax and not sharpening it. And so investing in yourself, I look at it as, as sharpening the ax, right? Yeah. It's getting ready to, before you go out there and, and, and do whatever it is that you're going to do. Totally. We need to be sharpening our financial IQ. I love it. I love it. All right. Point number two, what is the I quadrant and why is it important, Joey? I mean, we, we talked about this before, Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant. If you haven't read that book, it's a fantastic read and it kind of puts us all into perspective. But you go from the employee, which is like the E quadrant, and then he talks about the S quadrant being self-employed. And then you move to the right hand side. I'm trying to kind of visualize this for you. The right hand side has the business owner quadrant, which is B. And then the I is the investor and it's at the bottom right hand corner. So the E's do what? They How do they gain money? They trade time for money. And what are the S's, the self-employed do? They trade more time for money. <laughs> Double time A lot of time. <laughs> what do the B quadrant do? They trade others' time for money. And the I quadrant does what? I don't remember that. They, they invest money to make money. Exactly. They're, I'm sorry. Their money makes money. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. So what, what's important about that? Why do we want to be in the I quadrant? Well, because it gives you the most leverage of time. In my opinion, that, that is the, the beautiful thing about being in the I quadrant. There's other benefits, which I'm sure we can get into, but it absolutely gives you the most leverage. Right. It, it's at the point where you're in that example, what we said is you're using others time in the big quadrant. That's great, but somebody has got to supervise, right? right? Somebody has to show up and do some of the work there. So even the B quadrant is still trading small chunks of time for money. Right. And everybody else is it, that, whether it's the E or the S as well as the B, they're all trading time for money, just some more than others. The I is trading money for money, right? Like there, there is no necessarily time outside of the time that was invested, what we just covered a second ago, which is investing yourself to understand the thing, right? And understanding the thing that you're going to invest in. So, so JD, let's talk about the I quadrant. Let's talk about what Elon Musk has been able to do, right? He's been able to become an investor. How, how else 
can people learn from what investors do and what does that ultimately translate to? Um, well, I, so, so ultimately I think, I think really what it boils down to is the way that you receive income, right? And, um, investors receive income differently than say a W2 earner. So if I'm, if I'm a W2 earner, um, I receive income from my employer and I have to pay, uh, I think it's like 15.2% or whatever it is, uh, which is FICA and social security, right? So I pay half my employer matches that other half. And then whatever state you live in, if you have state tax, you have to pay state income tax. And of course you have to, you're responsible for federal income tax. So I'm, I'm taxed multiple different ways before that income ever gets into my checking account. And, uh, what investors do, um, not just, you know, exclusive to Elon Musk, but you look at Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, you know, and the like is that they take their income from stock and stock is taxed differently, right? It's, it's, it's not taxed at the same levels, uh, that normal W2 income is taxed at. No, a hundred percent. Right. All right. Mark, jump in there. What can we learn from the I quadrant? Why is this important to us? Ultimately that that's where we were. I'll speak for myself. That's where I want to get to. I, I started as an employee and it was because someone else invested into someone else's idea who then turned that idea into a business with that money. And then that business employed me. So I want to get to the point where I am the investor and those dollars are going out and helping other people create and that creation then sends dollars back my way. And I got to do it all by, um, as, as, as you so eloquently put at the start, uh, wrestling bears with my bare hands. Um, you know, probably more of a teddy bear as opposed to an actual bear. Those things are pretty big, shark claws. So, so that's, to, to me, that, that, that's why the I quadrant is important because let's face it, ultimately it is investment dollars that fuel small businesses, that fuel businesses. It's those investment dollars that allow those businesses to go out and create goods and services and then pay people for providing those and then other people pay for those services and that just keeps the wheel moving around. Well, isn't it also interesting too that investors tend to use OPM? Oh yeah. I'm actually looking into it right now, um, going and either getting a small business loan, uh, a SBA loan, or just going to get in a business loan from the bank so that I can go out and do a few more deals. So other people's money is much more frequently used by investors, pure I quadrant investors than their own, right? Because once you've invested in yourself, you have a skill, you have a talent, you've learned how to do something very well, or you develop networks through those mentorships and masterminds and meetups, all these things, right? You've developed the place that other people wish that they have. And what are they willing to do? They're willing to invest money with you. And what I, I've been so amazed by watching those who are in the I quadrant is that they very rarely put their own money in the deal. Ernie, what's one reason why somebody would like to be in the I quadrant and not have to put their own money in the deal? Have you, can you think of an example? Well, would you, would you be interested in creating an infinite return? Exactly. Explain is, to, me, is explain a, to is, everybody what you mean by that. What's a, what's a good rate of return? I, I think the average Joe on the street would say 8 to 12% my gross stock mutual fund. Because that's 12%. what they heard. Man, how about 30%? What about 100%? Would that be exciting to you? Well, the, the I side of the, the I quadrant is the opportunity to create an infinite return. When you don't have your money in the deal, when you have invested in yourself to be of the quality of person that can create a business like that, that is attractive to other investors and can communicate that to other people, that investment in yourself then gives you opportunity to draw on other investors. And for you, that's infinite return. Is that, is that high enough return? Is that attractive? <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's okay. Right. I'm interested. Like, tell me more. Right. I mean, that's really what we're, we're here for is we're, we're, we're here to get our lid raised. We're here to hear an idea that, that we didn't even think was possible. Right. We've always been someone who invested in someone else's eye. Right. Like we were the money. We were the other people's money. We were the OPM and someone else's deal. But the I quadrant individuals are putting together their own deals 
and are bringing on other investors, right? Because Elon Musk is not the only investor in Tesla, for instance, is he? No, he has lots of other people's money in there. Now, he's had to put some money into that deal. And when you take money out, as you were talking about a second ago, whenever you, when you sell stock, right? They, they pay tax at a different rate. They're going to pay tax based upon its gain if there is a taxable gain. But he also can take money out that is just basis, money he's already put into the company. And so he so, he doesn't pay himself a salary. He's able to just use stock. What is it, Joe, you want to jump in there? Well, I, I want to ask you, Russ, so what's a practical way uh, as, as you're listening to this that you can move into that I quadrant? Right. What someone wants to get involved in that. What is what is a, a practical step for them to do that? Well, I, I would say the the I quadrant isn't the first step. Right. I just I'm gonna push back just a second. Right. If you're if you're listening to this, we we believe that there's three phases, right? There's the there's the phase to getting started, going from zero passive income, getting you your first deal and upwards of 25% of passive income to your monthly expenses. And, and I believe inside of that step, there's some real basic things. We're actually rolling out this inside of our inner circle, the, the nine ways to get your first 5%. And there's a lot of little things that you can do within that to get that first 5%. And then Joey, as you and I have talked about over and over, like it's really starting to stack those things over and over again, right? Just repeating the process yes. to get to where we get to 25%. Now, I, I think that second phase of moving from 25% to 50% involves in investing deeper into your knowledge base. Like what you and I did, what we saw in our success is that we, before we really wanted to start investing in all these passive income strategies and start becoming an I quadrant investor, if you will, is that we needed to shore up our own house. We needed to make our own bed. We needed to be able to, um, have things organized so that our brain would have more space to even process the opportunities that would come across it. So I, right. I, I think we, we were talking about how do I become an, an I investor? I would say that starts once you get to 50% of, you know, the passive income coming in the door is compared to your monthly expenses. So if I got $10,000 of monthly expenses and I got $5,000 a month of passive income, now I start to think about, what are some of those ways that I can start diversifying my passive income streams? Maybe I've left the simple things that I was doing where maybe I was buying the real estate for my business. Maybe I was lending money to my business. Maybe I was lending money to friends or family, right? When, when you get in that top category, that's when you start investing and doing things like Mark was talking about with us on another podcast of being a, an, an eye investor within the ATM space. Right. You start looking for opportunities. Maybe those opportunities are in syndications. Maybe those opportunities are in deals that you've been a part of up to this point. And now you you have partners that are running those and you can just purely invest and you have a track record of investing in these things. And maybe that's when, you know, again, depending on the situation, your sophistication is when you you start bringing on other people's money. I, I may say. You know, what we, we we talk about this in our passive income mastermind. This is typically where the passive income mastermind people, people are going from 100% to 200% is when they really start using other people's money. But I think from a practical standpoint, Joe, you got to make sure you've done those first couple of things right. Otherwise, I think if you just start real thinking about that. All right. Last thing, because I know, I know we're running out of time here. The, the last point is ways to pay zero in taxes. Joey, how can somebody literally pay zero in taxes, because that's one of the things that people were so frustrated with Elon Musk is that for many years, he paid virtually zero in taxes. You've heard it been said that, you know, Warren Buffett's assistant pays more in tax than he does, right? How, how is that really possible? And what is it can we can learn from that? Well, I think there's a combination of a bunch of different strategies. So I won't go into all of them. Maybe some of the coaches can, can uh, jump in with some, but one I'll mention is bonus depreciation. So this is a huge factor for people who are, let's say that you are in a W-2 situation. And so you've got this active income that's very hard to offset, right? But there are certain types of investments that offer this bonus depreciation that can go against an active income. 
And, and what I mean by that is in not in addition to what the, the government would allow for a normal depreciation of an asset over a long period of time, they will offer a bonus in the first year, let's say, of that particular asset investment that then is above and beyond the norm. And that will then could be then applied to some of the active income. And there's many different things like our ATMs, for instance, um, offered that. And so anyways, there's, there's a lot of different potential applications there, but that's just one that I would mention. What's you, JD? What, what would you say? How can someone pay zero in taxes? What are different ways that that's possible? Uh, legally or illegally? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm Let's kidding. Stick with legal for right now. I'm kidding. <laughs> That's a different hey. podcast. Right. Right. I'm sorry. That's that'll be in a couple hours. Um, ways that you can avoid paying taxes. Um, you know, you you said one earlier that that really caught my eye because it's something that I've I've recognized myself is so when I invest in one of my companies capital that I've already you know pay taxes on, um, and then I want to take that back out. Like I can take that out without having to pay any taxes on because it's considered what's known as, as qualified basis, tax basis, which is money that's you've already paid taxes on. I think, uh, there's, Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. It just hit me. So, so here's, here's, here's real quick. What I've learned is that there's basically three things that the government is willing to basically give you tax credits or subsidies for. And these are initiatives that the government has. Uh, one is affordable housing, right? Naturally, the government wants people to invest in housing that's affordable for consumers so that they don't have to have um, that on their balance sheet. The second is job creation. Naturally, if you're out starting a business and creating jobs, that's something that the government doesn't have to pay for. And the third is clean energy. So whether that is creating battery-powered cars like Tesla, right? Or that is green energy like uh, solar uh, or wind or those types of things, the government is willing to give you tax credits and subsidies to invest in those types of things because that takes pressure off of their budget. And so I think once we understand what the government is looking at and what they're willing to give you credits for, if you just go do those things and look at Elon, he's basically doing two of the three. He's creating jobs and he's investing in clean energy. And so of course he gets massive tax breaks for doing that. But and let's be honest, some people do sleep in their Teslas because they love them so much. And so that could be affordable housing too. I mean, that's much cheaper than buying like a $150,000 house or $300,000 house for it. Hmm. Immediately. Right. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Mark, what are some ways that somebody could pay zero in taxes? You could, you, you could conceivably pay zero in taxes if you pay someone who is a professional to help you find those legal, those, those legal parts to not have to pay to get you all those credits. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's basically it. But I, I, I kind of want to go back to, to, to JD's one about creating jobs. When I worked in Japan, it was phenomenal. We, we never understood why are there salary men? Why, 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 why does Japan have salary men? Like you got these behemoth companies and everyone's just banging out emails to bang out emails. You know, it's like you show up at work and like, I'm going to send an email to Joey. Hey, Joey, how's it going? Joey said, it's going good. What about Russ? And you just have all these salary people. Well, you come to find out the government over there was extremely clear on what they said. They said, you can either, you now make X amount of money as a corporation, you can either hire more people and pay them, or we're gonna tax you the equivalent amount as if you had hired more people. Because one way or another, that person is gonna get some type of assistance. And if you hire them, then we don't have to do it. But if you choose not to hire them, you make so much money, we're just gonna come and take it. And then go give it to them for doing nothing. So that's why if you go to Japan, you, you, you see the person at the door, you see the person at the elevator, you see the person everywhere. And you're like, why are there so many people standing around doing nothing? Well, it's because the government has incentivized the employer. You can either hire them and make them do something or you're going to pay for it and then you'll have nobody there. Mm -hmm. So to me, the, 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 the ultimate way is I am not going to read the tax code. I have better things to do with my day. So I'm willing to trade some of my treasure to hang on to my time and to leverage someone else's time and knowledge in that space to help me navigate it so that I don't have to do it. Well, I, I thought you were going to jump in with this because I, I know we've talked about this before. I think it was Robert Allen's book, Nothing Down, that really made this clear. I may be wrong on that one, but where you buy real estate, right? You buy rental real estate 
and you buy at least one property every year, right? And just assume some level of appreciation. You Every 10 years, you refinance out the equity of that piece of property and its appreciation now is what you live on for that year. And then every year you've got the second house you bought the second year, right? So you're 11, you're taking the equity out of it and you're 12, so forth and so on. How much in taxes do we have to pay on the equity we take out of the houses? Zero. Zero, right? Like that was one of those concepts. And Joey, you and I met with uh, David McKnight. He wrote the book, The Power of Zero. And there was many different strategies, but that one strategy of, of using rental real estate as an example is one of the ways that you can pay zero in taxes. Ernie, what's another way you can pay zero in taxes? You don't have any taxable income. <laughs> Okay. They, yes. If you're, if you would usually, uh, there's ways in, in your businesses where you would take income and then pay for your expenses. There's certain things in your business that can be expenses of the business that you wouldn't necessarily have to take taxable income for equity in the house. Great option. A similar option that I think that we all know about, but I think is not well caught on to is, is cash value inside of life insurance policies. Mm. If you build up significant value in in types of life insurance, that can become an income stream, not subject to income tax. Mm. And then everything on top of that that you would take, minus expenses, minus deductions, you know, if there's anything left over to pay taxes, you could do that. But I think the simple thing is don't have any taxable income. Well, I, I heard it said once by, I don't remember who it was, as far as why why the rich don't pay or the wealthy or whoever you want to point the finger at, why, why don't they pay more in taxes? And this, this professional said, because they don't owe them, right? They don't pay more in taxes because they don't owe any more in taxes. And it is because they've done these things. They've invested in themselves. Oftentimes they've either become a B quadrant business owner, which to Mark's point allows them to get some of those credits that JD was pointing out right? Or they become an investor, right? In that I quadrant. And to your point, Ernie, through that, they're able to uh, use a lot of the investment, the expenses, like, you know, when you go travel to go see your properties in Hawaii, Mark, that becomes a taxable expense, right? Now a, a trip becomes an expense. How beautiful is that? Like Joey and I were teaching inside the inner circle on Tuesday, how paying our kids, right? to use the dollar and then the money they're using and receiving, they're using to pay for their gymnastics, for their art, for their events and, and travel trips that they go on. Well, because of their standard deduction of $12,000 for every $12,000 they earn, they don't pay any dollars in tax. They can offset it, right? So there's ways to do that, but you have to invest in yourself. You have to know what's going on so you know what to do. And I, well, that's that's a wrap for today, guys. I, we, well, hold on, we I, got, I, got, I got one more. Uh, and, then, and, and then and then it'll be a wrap. Let me ask you a question. By, by show of hands, who likes to eat? I like oh, to yeah. eat. Yes, sir. Meals for the convenience of the employer. Exactly. Come on. That one right there is one of my favorites because I get to basically write off my groceries. I get to write off all my food that I bring home. If you don't know what JD is talking about, by the way, this is just things that inside the inner circle with inside the financial MBA lessons that we've learned from CPAs and tax attorneys that we share is so much that you're missing if you're not a part of this. So take action right now, go to wealthwhitewallstreet.com forward slash inner circle, and you can participate. But now we've got to jump into this inner circle. We've got to get into the Q and A. I know there's a lot of questions out of what was just discussed. We thank you as always at being a listener to this show. If there's somebody, you know, that would benefit from it, please pass it along rate, review it. We'd love to have more people listening. We thank you as always. Have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.